Hello. When archaeologists do historical archaeology in North America, they quite often encounter coins and tokens in their excavations. However, most North American archaeologists don't get explicit training in numismatic evidence. So in today's video, I'd like to introduce briefly the topic of colonial coinage, with particular emphasis on the coins and tokens that would have been circulating in Upper and Lower Canada in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. To understand the role of colonial coins and tokens, it's important to understand mercantilism. Mercantilism was both the economic theory and the economic basis of colonialism. Its basic tenet was that countries should maintain a positive trade balance, meaning that they should export more than they import, but in particular, that there should be a flow of gold and silver into their country rather than flowing out of the country. To accomplish this, Countries like Spain, France, and the United Kingdom set up rules, regulations, and legal frameworks such that their colonies provided raw materials for their manufacturing sector and markets for their manufactured goods. In this system, the mother country had exclusive access to the colony's raw materials, while the colony became something of a captive market for the mother country's manufactured goods. In the context of British North America, theoretically at least, all of the colonies traded exclusively with Britain. Initially, the most important resources in the northern colonies were furs and cod, while southern colonies, after bringing in thousands of Africans forced into slavery, became a major source of cotton for Britain's textile industry. Meanwhile, France had its own colonies in the northern and central parts of North America, mostly focused on the fur trade, while Spain had colonies in the southern portions. After 1754, in a war that Americans know as the French and Indian War, and which is known as the Seven Years' War elsewhere, France lost all of its Canadian colonies, and these fell under the control of Britain. However, the small supply of coinage that France had supplied to her colonies continued to circulate in Canada for many decades after that. But most of the colonial powers had far-reaching mercantile networks. Britain also had extensive trade with Portugal, and several colonies in the Caribbean that were part of its mercantile network. This led to kind of a triangular network in which the colonies could trade either with Britain or with each other. But they weren't legally allowed to trade directly with other countries. Not surprisingly, smuggling did occur, and British authorities varied in the degree to which they enforced the laws. During this period, the currency that dominated all trade was the so-called Spanish dollar, actually the eight reales coin of the Spanish Empire. This large coin, minted from silver taken from mines in Mexico and Peru, was something like the US dollar of its day, an internationally acceptable currency that was used in markets in all the colonies in eastern North America. In fact, the reason that to this day we sometimes refer to 25 cents as two bits is that a quarter of a dollar was two reales in the Spanish system. Because of mercantilist policies, there was almost always a chronic shortage of coinage in the colonies. Although Britain did ship coinage to the colonies, in part to pay troops, the coins tended to be shipped right back again to pay for manufactured goods. Consequently, local merchants and their customers had a great deal of difficulty finding cash for their transactions. British currency consisted of the pound, divided into 20 shillings. The gold guinea was originally worth one pound, but during the late 18th and early 19th centuries it was worth 21 shillings because of increases in the price of gold. The shilling, one twentieth of a pound, was a silver coin just a little bit smaller than a modern U.S. quarter, and the shilling was itself subdivided into 12 pence, represented by a copper penny. There were 240 pence in a pound. It may seem odd to us today, but the Royal Mint in London that struck most of the coins for the British Empire did not consider the provision of a useful currency for the economy to be its main purpose. It did strike silver shillings and other coins, but it mainly struck silver and gold coins only when people brought bullion to the mint for coinage. The government profited from the small difference between the face value of the coins and the bullion value of the coins something called seniorage, so in effect coinage was a sort of tax on bullion. 
and although the mint did strike copper coins as well, it didn't really make much profit on them, and so the mint didn't really produce enough copper coins for the demand. In fact, it struck no copper coins at all in the years following 1775. To fulfill that demand, a lot of people produced counterfeit copper coins. Counterfeiting was an extremely serious crime, but people found ingenious ways to try to evade anti-counterfeiting laws. One of these ways was to change the design of the coin as well as to insert the word token in its legend. Often, these tokens were theoretically only to be used in a particular establishment, but in fact they circulated widely just like regular coins. Even in England, the want of small change was severe. As Faulkner wrote, the dearth of small change creates a want that is pressing and immediate. All suffer alike under it, and the humblest member of society probably feels its force with the greatest intensity. Faulkner quotes a dealer in Yorkshire who in 1812 said, I used to give a premium in London to get silver, but that premium increasing, I was compelled to discontinue it, and until the issuing of local tokens, I was daily under the necessity of refusing goods to customers from being unable to furnish them with change. Faulkner cites another example from Devon. The tradesmen who issued tokens announced by public advertisement that they would pay them off on or before a certain day, and about two-thirds of what had been issued was brought in for payment. The result was that the retail trade immediately came to a stand, and several of our most respected inhabitants called upon the issuers to reissue. Given these shortages of coinage, colonial governors struggled with the problem of how to make sure there was enough coinage available in their colonies for the functioning of their economies. One tool in their arsenal was to manipulate exchange rates. By overvaluing gold and silver relative to the mother country, they could attract coins made of those metals into the colony and lessen the incentive for them to flow out of the colony. A commonly used exchange rate in the British North American colonies was called Halifax currency. It rated a Spanish dollar at five shillings, or 60 pence, instead of the four shillings sixpence that was uh, current in England. An alternative one, called York currency because it was current in New York for a period of time, rated the Spanish dollar even higher at eight shillings, or 96 pence. Such overvaluations lessened the incentive to melt down silver or export it to other countries. Sometimes these overvaluations took a physical form instead of just being exchange rates published in a printed broadside. In a few British colonies, including Prince Edward Island, colonial governments arranged to punch a hole in the center of some Spanish dollars. They then counterstamped both the outer ring and the central plug, meaning that they stamped it with a special design, in this case a sunburst design, to show that the governor authorized the pieces to pass at a certain rate. In the case of Prince Edward Island, that rate was five shillings for the outer ring and one shilling for the plug, or six shillings altogether. That amounted to an overvaluation of more than 33%. But exchange rates alone couldn't completely solve the problem, and some colonies resorted to issues of local coins to try to fill the demand. The first of the British North American colonies to do this was the Massachusetts Bay Colony. In 1652, the colonial government there ordered a local silversmith to strike lightweight shillings, six pennies, and three pennies to fill local demand. As these coins were more than 20% lighter than their sterling counterparts, they were unlikely to be acceptable outside the colony. And that was a satisfactory result because it kept the coins circulating in the colony where the governor wanted them to be. The colony continued to date the coins 1652 for some three decades because they wanted to maintain the illusion that the coins were struck during the period when there was no king in England, King Charles I having been executed in 1649 and prior to the restoration of the monarchy in 1660. Nonetheless, the British government put a stop to the issue of these coins in 1682. In 2004, archaeologists working in Fairyland in southeastern Newfoundland made a very surprising discovery. This was a previously unknown type of lead token struck only with the letters DK, presumably for David Kirk, who was the governor there. Since then, others have been found in three different sizes, presumably representing different denominations. These are likely the earliest coin-like instruments ever struck in British North America 
predating even the Massachusetts silver coins. Being legally prevented from issuing coinage, a lot of 18th century colonies resorted to issues of paper money. These were kind of like IOUs. This one from Connecticut, for example, promises to pay 40 shillings by January 2nd, 1777. These were never popular because of the substantial risk that they would not be redeemed. Consequently, they tended to circulate only at a discount. By the 19th century, private businesses were issuing their own paper money as well. We call these private issues scrip, and again, the text on the scrip tends to provide a promise to pay a certain amount by a certain date. But paper scrip was a last resort, and it was never popular with the public because of the very real risk that it would become worthless. People were more accustomed to money that consisted of metallic coinage, and even counterfeits were preferable to most kinds of paper scrip. Consequently, a lot of what circulated in the British North American colonies in the late 18th and early 19th centuries consisted of counterfeits of English and Irish halfpennies. Some of the 19th century ones were extremely crude and intentionally made to imitate extremely worn halfpennies of the previous century. Numismatists call these blacksmith tokens, based on the rumor that some of them were made by a blacksmith to pay for his visits to the tavern. Often these blacksmith tokens have the design in reverse because their makers forgot to reverse the design on the punch they used to strike them. During and after the American Revolution, the former colonies, now states of the new Union, continued to issue paper money. But now it was denominated in Spanish dollars, as on this one from Rhode Island. The issuing states also offered interest on the notes to make them more acceptable to the public so that they were kind of like a circulating version of a government bond. But with its Coinage Act of 1792, the United States made a very bold move. The Act established the U.S. Mint and a new currency system that was a decimal system, with the dollar divided into a hundred cents. Prior to this, only Tsar Peter the Great's Russia had adopted a decimal system for its coinage. Another innovation was that the U.S. Mint would operate as a service to the citizens. Consequently, if citizens brought silver or gold to the Mint to be made into coins, the Mint would make them for free. And what was particularly unusual is that it would provide copper coinage as a public service. At the core of the new monetary system was the silver dollar, which by legislation was to have the same value as a Spanish dollar. But in fact, it was actually slightly more pure in silver than a Spanish dollar. The new mint also made half dollars, quarter dollars, and smaller silver coins, but also thousands and thousands of copper cents, which were the mainstay of day-to-day -day transactions. Soon the U.S. dollar was competing with the Spanish dollar in international trade, and U.S. coins began to circulate in the remaining British colonies as trade continued between them, much as it had done in the pre-revolutionary period. Montreal, for example, had extensive trade with New York. As you might expect, the War of 1812 put a damper on trade between the United States and the British colonies. That included cutting off supplies of U.S. coinage, which had become an extremely important part of the coinage system in the colonies. All this at a time when there were increasing expenditures due to the war. To alleviate these problems, in July of 1812, the Legislative Council of Lower Canada authorized a very large issue of paper money. The larger denominations of these notes carried an interest rate of 4%. As you can see, the notes are denominated in dollars, along with their equivalent in Halifax currency. The war also had an impact on the slogans and designs that began to appear on tokens that were imported into the British colonies in North America. Ships, colonies, and commerce was an allusion to Napoleon's claim that these were the three things that were going to allow Britain to defeat him. Tokens that depicted Wellington and listed his victories against Napoleon became very popular. And after HMS Shannon captured the USS Chesapeake outside Boston's harbor in June of 1813, tokens were imported into Halifax commemorating this victory and the captain of the Shannon, Philip Broke. On a sadder note, tokens were imported into Upper and Lower Canada to commemorate the British victory at Queenston Heights in 1812 but the death of its commander, General Sir Isaac Brock, who died on the battlefield. 
In the years following the war, several banks were founded in the British North American colonies. One of the ways they profited was by the issue of paper money. Although the banks were expected eventually to redeem their notes in gold or silver, all the notes that were in circulation were effectively like a large interest-free loan to the bank. In the 1820s and 1830s, there was a series of short recessions, and in 1826, Britain banned trade between British colonies and the United States. These events caused economic hardship in the colonies. In Upper Canada, for example, they depended a lot on exports of lumber and wheat to the United States. So as you can imagine, these measures were not very popular. Things worsened further in the 1830s. In 1834, the United States Mint changed the composition of its gold and silver coins to reflect changes in the price of gold. The higher value of gold in the United States caused what little gold coinage there was in the Canadian colonies to vanish from circulation. This caused Upper Canada, which had particularly strong economic ties with the United States, to completely revise its monetary rating system, so that all gold coins were demonetized except British and American ones, and the value of the U.S. gold eagle was set at 50 shillings. These changes put Lower Canada out of sync with Upper Canada, causing some economic confusion. To make matters worse, Andrew Jackson's economic policies, particularly his refusal to renew the charter of the Bank of the United States, and his insistence that land grants be paid for in gold and silver coins, led to the Panic of 1837. During the Panic, people hoarded coinage, leading to a severe shortage in circulation. There were also runs on the banks, and having so many people try to redeem their banknotes at once led to further shortages of coinage. Given these circumstances, there was a flurry of token issues on both sides of the border. Many of the tokens were political, like this one lambasting Andrew Jackson. In 1837, there were hundreds of issues of private paper scrip in the British North American colonies, as well as new imports of copper tokens. To accommodate illiterate users of the scrip, a lot of the scrip shows pictures of the coins they were intended to replace. This one, for example, shows a picture of a Spanish-American two reales piece, which would be the equivalent of a quarter dollar, 15 pence, or 30 sous. In Lower Canada, the most popular series of new tokens is called the bouquet sous because it depicts a bouquet of flowers on one side. Sous was the French word for a half penny, but 1837 was also the year of rebellions in Upper and Lower Canada. And one of the bouquet sous, issued by the Banque du Peuple, was widely interpreted as expressing sympathy for the rebellion by showing a star and a head wearing a liberty cap on the reverse. The symbolism may have been subtle, but it certainly got noticed. And consequently, even today, these are called the rebellion sous. If bouquet sous were the most popular tokens in Lower Canada, in Upper Canada, one of the most common tokens in this period depicted a sailing sloop. In an article he published in 1880, the Toronto historian Henry Scadding claimed that these tokens depict the sloop Duke of Richmond. However, it seems like a pretty generic depiction of the kind of shipping that would have been on Lake Ontario at the time, and Scadding's account may be apocryphal. Not surprisingly, many of the tokens that were imported into Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island, and New Brunswick depict ships and have slogans that refer to trade navigation, and fisheries. But there were also tokens issued by individual businesses, such as hardware stores and wholesale importers. Newfoundland also experienced coin shortages, and by the 1840s, one of the better tokens in circulation were the tokens of Rutherford Brothers. Slogans on tokens were a major vehicle for the sentiments of the time. Some expressed justification for token issues, like commercial change, or to facilitate trade. Some were more political, like self-government and free trade, or encourage country importers. And some expressed the common distrust of paper money with pure copper preferable to paper. Since all the colonies experienced coin shortages, tokens imported into one colony quickly spread into the others. Consequently, tokens that were very common in Montreal soon found their way to Toronto, where they circulated alongside tokens that had been imported specifically to Upper Canada. 
But even with all the new imports of copper tokens, there was a serious shortage of small change, and a bewildering array of coins and tokens filled the gap. In most colonies, small change was in such short supply that most merchants had to make do with bizarre combinations of worn halfpenny tokens, low denomination private notes issued by various businesses that may not be able to redeem them, as well as banknotes. Given the risks that they would not be redeemed, much of the paper currency circulated only at a discount. In recollections he published some 45 years later, Sir George Duncan Gibb described some of the coins he found in circulation circa 1830. Believe it or not, that even included occasional ancient Greek and Roman coins that he encountered in circulation in Montreal. Spanish, Portuguese, and French silver were the common medium of exchange, he says, associated with that of the United States and Mexico. Copper of all countries found Canada the real land of circulating freedom, and so bad was some of this currency that it induced the various local banks to issue copper money on their own account. Here Gibbs is referring to penny and halfpenny tokens imported by the Citibank, Banque du Peuple, Quebec Bank, and Bank of Montreal. One of the reasons these bank tokens were popular is that they were of full weight, meaning that they weighed the same as English pennies and halfpennies. Although people tolerated lightweight copper tokens when they had to, they strongly preferred coins of full weight, especially in the case of gold and silver coins. This might seem strange to us today because we don't really care how much metal is in our coins, but it was quite important in the 1830s. In fact, one of the reasons there were so many lightweight tokens in Upper and Lower Canada and the other British colonies was that people profited by importing them. Even after paying for the copper and the cost of manufacture in some place like Birmingham and the fee for transporting them across the Atlantic, they might still make a profit of 15 or 20 percent when they put them into circulation. And the worst tokens would yield even higher profits. This particular halfpenny token was issued by the hardware firm of Thomas Storrow Brown. Even though it was heavier than most of the lightweight copper in circulation in Montreal at the time, one of the Montreal newspapers denounced Brown's tokens as a profiteering scheme. In the wake of this scandal, Brown acquired the nickname of Copper Tommy. In Canada West, as Upper Canada was then known, it was the Bank of Upper Canada that issued full weight tokens. Its head office from 1827 until the bank's collapse in 1866 is this building, which still stands on Toronto's Adelaide Street. Although they were issued by a bank, these tokens had such privileged status that they circulated almost as though they were government currency. In an environment when the British government was still reluctant to give colonies the right to issue their own coinage. However, you'll note the word token in the legend to make it clear that they're not claiming to be coins. Even before the issue of the bank tokens, some colonies did attempt to create a colonial coinage. In 1817, the government of Nova Scotia decided to issue half pennies for the province, but the British government refused permission, citing royal prerogative. In 1823, the province went ahead and ordered half penny tokens through a Liverpool agent, even though they did not have any permission from the British government. These tokens circulated for a long time before the British government took any notice of them. New Brunswick followed Nova Scotia's example in 1843 with a large issue of halfpenny and penny tokens, and a second issue in 1854. Although these weren't technically legal tender, thus the word token in their legend, they effectively circulated as coinage, and helped to put a glut of lightweight and spurious tokens out of circulation. Even after all these improvements to the coinage, by the late 1850s it was still in a pretty sorry state. Many years later, the numismatist R. W. McLaughlin recalled what kinds of coins he could find in Montreal in the late 1850s. There were in circulation, besides the bank tokens, he says, any number of sous, tiffins, harps, wellingtons, ships and blacksmiths, besides a goodly sprinkling of other less common Canadians. Of British coins, there were plenty of worn halfpennies of George II and III, with many varieties of 18th and 19th century trade tokens. Of United States coins, there were always some of the large cents, although worth more than a halfpenny. A few colonials, an occasional fugio and nova constellatio, 
and considerable numbers of the state issues of Connecticut, Vermont, and New Jersey. Then there were always a good sprinkling of Jacksonians and Hard Times tokens. There were also many foreign coins present in considerable numbers. Three especially were ever in circulation. They were the one Skilling of Denmark, dated 1771, the one Kreutzer of Austria, 1816, and the one Skilling of Norway, 1820. French, Spanish, and Portuguese also abounded, as well as some of the other countries of Europe. By the 1850s, there was a lot of dissatisfaction with the state of the currency in the province of Canada, and many people were lobbying to have the province finally adopt a decimal currency, but the British government opposed such a change. Finally, in 1853, there was a compromise when the province of Canada passed the Currency Act. This act allowed accounts to be kept in both pounds and dollars. Then, in 1857, the province revised the act, requiring all provincial accounts to be kept in dollars. And they finally received permission to issue a provincial coinage, which began in 1858. Initially, it consisted only of copper cents and silver 20 cent pieces. Other denominations only joined in three years after Confederation, in 1870. Soon other colonies followed suit, like the province of Nova Scotia and the province of New Brunswick. In Newfoundland, it was discovery of deposits of copper and gold in 1864 that led to the province's first coinage. Unusually for a colonial coinage, these included not only copper cents and silver coins, but also $2 gold coins. Archaeological excavations on historic sites often find at least one or two coins or tokens. These are usually single finds, presumably accidentally dropped and then never recovered. Hordes of coins or tokens are much rarer finds and usually result when someone intentionally buries them in the ground. Many such hoards are savings hoards, groups of coins that someone squirreled away either because there were no banks or because they didn't trust banks. Some other hoards may represent pay shipments to troops or employees, or stolen property that thieves have buried but for some reason never recovered. Shipwrecks yield some of the largest caches of coins, sometimes because the ships were carrying pay for troops or money to finance trade in the East Indies, and most famously, Spanish galleons were carrying gold and silver from the New World back to Spain, usually in the form of coin. Probably the best Canadian example was the wreck of the Chameau near Louisbourg in 1725. The Chameau was carrying a large shipment of gold, silver, and copper coins when she struck the rocks and a group of treasure hunters salvaged most of these coins in 1965. One of the more obvious uses of coins for archaeologists is to date the deposits in which they're found. The basic principle is that the deposit can be no earlier than the date of the latest coin found in it, something archaeologists call terminus post quem. However, we should be skeptical of dates derived this way. For one thing, terminus post quem only provides the earliest possible date and some coins circulated for many, many decades. Secondly, the date on a coin or token is not always the date that it was struck or issued. Occasionally, the date could refer to the year a firm was founded. More importantly, some lightweight tokens struck in the 1830s were made in imitation of heavier tokens struck some 20 years earlier. A good example of that are the 1812 dated tokens issued by a Montreal merchant named Tiffin. And remember those Massachusetts silver pieces that kept the date 1652 right up until 1682. Even more famously, Austria's silver talers of Empress Maria Theresa were struck with the date 1780 at least as recently as the 1960s. Having said that, the fact that most coins have dates that represent their year of issue does make coins and tokens an excellent source of chronological information, and this is particularly true in the case of hoards. If we plot the chronological distribution of coins in a hoard, as you see here, we can learn quite a lot. We can see that the date of closure of the hoard, that is the date when the last coin was probably added to it, was about 1675. 
we can also see that the main period of the hoard's accumulation was probably between 1645 and 1675. But the unusual trimodal distribution tells us that something more interesting is going on. Possibly there were three separate periods of accumulation over two or three generations, or perhaps the person making the hoard intentionally added very old coins to it, maybe because their silver content was higher. On historic sites, coins can also tell us something about the economy. In part, that's because people expected coins to contain a weight of metal very nearly worth the face value of the coin. When there's a lot of lightweight or debased coins in circulation, people tend to try to spend those ones as quickly as possible and hoard the coins that have a higher intrinsic value. This habit led to the expression, bad money drives out the good, and could be a partial explanation for the total mess of coins and tokens that were in circulation in the Canadian provinces in the 1830s. But we have to keep in mind that the coins that archaeologists find are not even close to being a random sample. Whenever someone lost a high-value coin, especially a gold one, they looked really hard to find it. And many kinds of hoards are also biased in favor of high-value coins, and often include quite old coins, especially if they have higher bullion content. Modern coin hoards are an anomaly because we usually hoard coins that we want to get rid of. These are low-value coins that nobody cares about. Individual coins from archaeological excavations tend to be low-value ones because no one put much effort into trying to find them once they dropped them. As already noted, a lot of foreign coins circulated in the colonies, and to some extent these reflect trade connections, although the ways these coins reached the colonies could be very complex. In Nova Scotia, for example, Spanish doubloons were much more common than U.S. gold coins, which dominated in Upper Canada. Similarly, tokens that were imported for use in one colony often traveled to others. And how these are distributed can give us some sense of the strength of connections between colonies. Higher than usual densities of individual coin finds can also help us identify businesses. For example, archaeologists are much more likely to find large numbers of half pennies where there used to be a tavern or a corner store than they would in an ordinary residence. In addition, some tokens even depict those places of business. And when these have since disappeared, the images of these buildings on the tokens can sometimes be our best evidence for what the buildings used to look like. If you'd like to learn more about the applications of numismatics to historical archaeology in North America, a very useful guide is this book, Numismatic Archaeology of North America, a Field Guide, by Marjorie Aiken, James Bard, and Kevin Aiken. I also want to remind you that if you want to be updated as I make new videos, you can always click on the subscribe button down below. Thank you, and stay safe.